Hello, this is lecture number two of Intro to Medieval Studies at Marlborough College. Today we're talking about Byzantium and Islam, um, starting with Byzantium and then moving on to Islam. And if you recall, last time we mentioned that Byzantium really didn't think of itself as the Byzantine Empire. They thought of themselves as Rome. Um, the emperor had lived in Constantinople for many, many years before the West disappeared for almost two centuries. Um, they considered themselves the emperor, the inheritor of the Roman tradition. Um, the name Byzantium merely comes from the old Roman fort city of, of Byzantium, which is what we would refer to as Constantinople, which is what it became um, essentially named after actually Constantine himself, Constantinople. Um, and this empire you, often gets short shrift. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, but first we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what its continuing importance was. Um, so if you recall, Last time we talked about the division of the empire um, in, in 292 by Diocletian, where he sets up this new bureaucratic system, two emperors, uh, two Augustuses and two Caesars, one in Rome, one in Constantinople, and their military leaders, and, and this sort of more diaphanous but theoretically bureaucratically sound rulership that was supposed to end the chaos um, amongst the emperors of the third century. Um, and while this doesn't actually work, right, it does make Constantinople a real power center. And even after Constantine takes apart what Diocletian had done and reunites the empire, um, he moves to Constantinople. He makes that the new imperial center um, and in some ways sets up what will be Byzantium. And it's worth noting that even as the, the various tribes come in, and we talked last time, this is 476, right? Right at the moment when um, Odoacer kills Orestes, and then the Eastern Emperor has Odoacer himself killed by Theodoric, who writes a letter and says, there is no more Western Empire. Um, there is now the Kingdom of Italy run by me. Um, and the Eastern Empire doesn't, the Eastern Emperor doesn't necessarily like this, um, but the West really has degenerated into this set of smaller kingdoms, all of which are run by different barbarian kings or princes. Um, Theodoric, of course, is here in Italy. Um, we mentioned the Franks last time that will be important later on. The Visigothic kingdom is down here. Um, we mentioned them. They're one of the first to sort of sweep through Italy, but eventually set up this fairly large kingdom here. Um, the Vandals in North Africa. Um, at any rate, what is, one of the things that these kingships do is they consistently look to the East for legitimization of their rule. They, when one king takes over from another king, frequently by violent means, they will look to the emperor and say, I am the legitimate ruler. Isn't that right? And the emperor is supposed to write back and say, yes, we acknowledge you as the legitimate ruler. Um, and this situation continues until Charlemagne, we'll, we'll talk about that, that next time, what the shift that Charlemagne makes is going to the Pope instead of going to the Emperor, and that, that sets up a lot of things that we're going to talk about in the coming weeks. Um, but needless to say, the Eastern Empire still maintains, just by virtue of the fact of being the Roman Empire, or the Roman Emperor, maintains a prestige that all of the barbarian kingdoms still look to. Um, and throughout this time period, from 500 basically until the appearance of Islam, um, many of these kings look to the emperor for legitimization, and the emperor frequently tries to take back chunks from the kings, um, particularly when they are not looking to him enough for legitimization. Um, and some emperors are more successful at this than others, but there are um, efforts to take back Sicily, parts of Italy. They actually own Ravenna. Ravenna remain, remains an imperial city for a very long time. Um, I mentioned Ravenna, it's, it's right about there at the, the top of the Ionian Gulf that came up in the, in the primary source last time that I read from. Um, and just to give you a, a taste of what's coming, right, this situation continues until the, Arab, the Arabs appear. And this is what it's going to look like then, right? This is a radically different map than, than this one is with all of these little kingdoms in North Africa and Spain. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to this in just a minute. So here we are in 600, moving forward 100 years, and as you can see, not much has changed. The Visigothic Kingdom is still here in Spain. 
Um, they've lost a little bit of territory in France um, to the Burgundians. The, the, these are the uh, Austrasian Franks. The, these are all various different groups of Franks. The Vandals are still here in North Africa. And of course, here's Constantinople. And it's actually labeled in 600, it's still labeled, and this is made by a modern person obviously, but still labeled the Roman Empire. They think of themselves, and it follows roughly Diocletian's line down here, um, although they actually do manage to take a chunk. Um, they take back Sicily, and you can see these, these bits in southern Italy. They also manage to own um, Ravenna at this point is referred to as the Exarchate of Ravenna. Um, so they, they've managed to take back some from the barbarian kingdoms, but it's still roughly split into eastern and western halves. Um, much of these successful uh, taking back of pieces of territory, particularly the Exarchate of Ravenna um, and Sicily, are accomplished by, by this guy, Justinian. And I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of Justinian because I'm going to talk about him for really about half the time that we're going to talk about Byzantium because he's pretty important. Um, this is in Ravenna. This is, this is the San Vitale church that is built during Justinian's reign, um, around 530. He, he reigns for a little longer than that. I'll, his dates will be on a um, couple slides from now. Um, but one of the things that to, to note, actually, is the architectural style looks Byzantine. Um, this does not look like classical Roman art. Um, if you look here in the apse, you can see the beginnings of these the long pointed feet and somewhat elongated bodies. Um, it's also notable that, that much of this is done um, in mosaic and is not painted. Mosaic is, is going to be a fairly classic artistic form in Byzantium. Um, and as I noted before, this is something that the barbarians, that the barbarian kingships, the, the Germanic kings in the West, look to for legitimization, right? This is what they want to emulate. So lo and behold, here is a church, um, San Apollinario Nuovo in, in Bologna, which is built by Theodoric. And this is the Theodoric that I mentioned last time, the Theodoric King of Italy, um, not the other Theodoric that we also mentioned. Um, and this is one of his churches, not built in the capital, it's built in Bologna, but still a very important city. Um, and you can see, again, these long lines of figures along the wall, much of it done in mosaic, um, and just compare that one more time to San Vitale here, um, again, particularly on the apse, right? So when they're looking for what imperial forms look like and what the image of rulers is, they're looking to the Byzantine models. Um, now, not to confuse anybody, just to note, this church is actually built before this church. Um, there are other examples of Byzantine churches that are built before Theodoric's. Uh, I just use this one as a comparison because it is one of the most famous. So it's not as if uh, I should be clear about that. Theodoric is not looking at this church in 500, but he has the other one built. This one has not been built yet. But um, the style is representative in, in other places, and I, I choose San Vitale because it's one of the most famous of the style, and, and it, um, to me, it is one of the most beautiful. So that's why we're looking at this one specifically. Anyway, back to this guy, Justinian um, himself. So here his, his reign dates 532 to 565. Um, he reigns over a very prosperous point in Byzantine history. They are expanding economically. Um, there's relative peace on their eastern border. He, as I mentioned, he manages to take back parts of Sicily. He strengthens the holdings at Ravenna and expands the territory around it in the, in the Exarchate of Ravenna. Um, but perhaps what he is most famous for is, is the passing of this set of law codes. Um, the, the Corpus Iuris Civilis, which he reaches back into previous Roman law compilations and the writings of jurists and opinions of lawyers and compiles this really massive new set of, of um, legal code that is supposed to be the law of the Roman Empire. Um, they start in 530 with the code itself, which is a sort of which is a set of laws. Um, 
And then 534, the institutes and the jive digest are added. Um, the institutes are laws taken from other sets that are sort of recompiled. The digest itself is a set of commentary by jurists. So the code and the institutes are both laws proper. The digest is other people commenting on laws. Um, and it's worth remembering what this is. This will come back several times throughout the medieval period. And then as you can see, 533, um, the novels. And they're called novels because quite literally they are new. Um, and they're usually laws passed by Justinian or his immediate predecessors that he feels are um, valid enough to be included in, in this collection. Um, also worth noting that, that Justinian comes to power. Here's another image of him, just to give you more stuff to look at. This is very classic mosaic style, right? The little um, chips of colored stone uh, placed together to, to make an image. And we'll go back to the previous one. This, this is him, obviously, here. Um, it's, it's a f they look, f well, somewhat similar. Not exactly, but it's the same. Um, what, what, what I would note is that it's the same iconography, right? They both have a halo. Um, the crown is actually of, of similar form. Um, and they also have the same imperial brooch, right? The, the, the way that the vestments are, are placed, um, the cape over one shoulder um, with this orange brooch in it is pretty much exactly the same as it appears in this image. Um, they are purple, the imperial color is purple. I don't know how this appears on your screen exactly, but um, that's a purple-ish color and a purple robe. So you, you can see that the, the image of the emperor is relatively consistent. Um, one of the other things that, that helps Justinian in his various conquests and, and in his increasing of, of Byzantine fortune, um, the Ostrogothic king Theodoric the Great um, and his nephew and heir, um, Athalaric, actually allow imperial interests in Italy. They, <clears throat> they want um, enough legitimization that they, they allow in um, new troops into Italy and uh, into Sicily, sorry. And actually the, the military leader Belisarius, who is one of Justinian's captains, um, successfully lays siege to both Naples and Rome itself, and for a while holds Rome. Um, all of this turns around, ah, sorry, one more note about Justinian. Perhaps what he is most famous for um, is the building of this building. This is the, the Hagia Sophia, one of the largest, I think it's the largest church in Constantinople itself. Um, of course, here you see it with minarets. It gets turned into a mosque under the Ottomans. Um, but it's an incredibly beautiful building and, and one of the finest representations of Eastern Orthodox architectural style. Um, before we turn to the Islamic conquests, one last note about um, Byzantium in general and about the 7th century. After Justinian's death, right, when this is the middle of the 6th century, during the 7th century, they really, they begin to have a reversal of fortune. Um, the Sassanids are no longer at peace with them, the Sassanid Persians. Um, they take Egypt for a little while, which is one of the wealthiest provinces of the East. Um, they begin to have some barbarian troubles in the Balkans, particularly from the Bulgars, um, which is where the, the state name Bulgaria comes from. Um, and at the same time, the Lombards appear in Italy, and the Lombards reduce the size of the exarchate. They take Rome, they take a number of cities that, that Justinian himself had managed to, to capture. And the Lombards are actually going to remain installed in Italy for the next, well, several hundred years, actually. They, they get subdued a bit by Charlemagne, and we'll return to that. Um, but from that point on, Byzantine interests in Italy really are declining. Um, the last note that I wanted to say about Byzantium is that it really gets short shrift in scholarship, as I mentioned at the beginning. And part of this is linguistic. It considers itself the Roman Empire, so they sometimes produce documents in Latin. Um, many of them know Latin, but the major language is Greek. Um, it's not ancient Greek. It's, it's sort of like comparing medieval Latin to classical Latin, comparing Byzantine Greek to classical Greek. Um, so 
people tend to need a lot of languages to study it. Um, and to make that just a little bit harder, of course, one of the major places you go to study it, Constantinople, is now Istanbul, and they don't speak any of those languages there. Um, so when I go to the archives, the languages that I am reading are the same as the ones that I'm speaking to the archivist. Um, but that's not true in Constantinople. It's, it's also true that, that um, because, of course, they were taken over by the Turk, a lot of their documents um, are no longer there. Um, or were destroyed or have been dispersed. So we don't have as much as we, we might want from Byzantine history. Um, another important aspect, and, and this is more of an intellectual run, one rather than an actual physical difficulty, is that Byzantine culture tends to archaicize. It tends to like to think of itself as using older forms. Um, and because of this 19th and 20th century scholarship, has tended not to view it as producing anything new, and therefore is not being very interesting. Um, it's a culture that, that had a lot of problems, particularly in the later medieval period. They're actually captured in 1204 by a crusader army. Um, they're restored in 1261 to Constantinople, but in 1453 they actually fall completely to the Ottoman Turk. Um, so they don't produce any famous histories or chronicles like you begin to see in the West. They don't create a lot of new poetic forms. Um, so this tends to get them dismissed, particularly, in, as I said, in 20th century scholarship. This is a little less true now, um, and more people are interested in, Byzant in Byzantium. In part because, and, and this is really what is important about it, it is one of the most stable political bodies throughout the medieval period. Right? In 533, under, under Justinian, they are a force to be reckoned with. Six or seven hundred years later, they're still a force to be reckoned with. And yes, in 1204, they, they, they get reckoned with by a crusader army. But um, the succession of emperors is relatively consistent. There are changes of dynasty, and, and some of them are better at it than others. Um, their border moves back and forth with Islam over this time period. Um, but they are a very consistent, very stable, um, centralized bureaucracy, something that the West uh, really has no equal for in most of the medieval period. Um, so, now that I've argued for their importance, we're moving on, which we should feel a little bit about, a little bit bad about, but as I said before, if anybody wants to do more of Byzantium, we can do more in the fourth section. There's certainly plenty of opportunities for doing um, individual papers and projects on it. So now, on to Islam. Um, conquests beginning in 632, um, and as you can see, if you recall, let's actually skip back a few slides to this map in 600. So in 600, we have the Sassanids over here, the Eastern Empire, they, they all, despite losing Egypt briefly, have Egypt back by 600, um, and a variety of barbarian kingdoms, both in North Africa and the Western Mediterranean. By, by 750, that has completely changed, and actually the one thing on this map that's worth noting, um, this map is circa 700. In 711, they invade Spain and actually make it all the way into the middle of France. Um, so by 750, this map is even, um, even more expansive, the amount of territory that will have um, fallen into Arabic hands. This is very, very fast and quite shocking. Um, and and I'll, I'll get to some of the ways in which that's the case in just a second. Um, stepping back just before 632, sort of 631 before the appearance of, the, of Islam as a major religion um, and Muhammad and his prophecies and his expansion. Um, most of the Arabs are, live in, in, a sort of, in a tribal society throughout the Arabian desert, which of course it covers most of the peninsula, um, stretches all the way um, across the Red Sea in the Arabian Sea. Um, some of these tribes are Jewish, some of these tribes um, are sort of animistic religions or, or um, whatever sort of tribal traditions that they hold. 
There are a number of Christians, particularly in the north, the Sinai Peninsula has, has many, many monasteries that persist, that are still there today. Um, Ethiopia as well is strongly Christian at this point. Um, and actually Ethiopia is still Christian, um, is still one of the, the, they consider themselves one of the oldest Christian communities in all of Africa, um, which, is, which is basically basically true. These groups act as traitors. Um, Rome itself, 200, 300 years before this, imports a lot of pepper. And pepper comes from, from well, beyond the ocean here. It comes from India and Southeast Asia. Um, it gets shipped often to Oman or the southern coast of Yemen. Um, there, there are trading outposts and cities um, along the Gulf of Aden. And from there, it, it will either get picked up by traders and shipped across the desert north, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to the economy, um, or continued by ship up the Red Sea, and then from there passed through Egypt to Alexandria, and from there throughout the Mediterranean. Um, but, but needless to say, these traders had contact on both sides of this ocean, contact with people from the east as well as with contact from the west. And it's part of this network that allows um, news and information and ultimately Islam itself to spread. Uh, it's worth noting that, <coughs> excuse me, what we know about early Islam comes almost exclusively from the Quran. Um, our knowledge of Muhammad himself is entirely based on the Quran. And, and a couple of other sources, um, hadith, which is, is sayings of the prophet, and these are things that um, he is purported to have said that are not direct prophecies from God, but are still sort of words of wisdom that people should study and know. Um, and then sirah, which is biography, which is, can be things that he said or did, but can also be stories told about him by his immediate circle of associates. Um, both of these traditions, Hadith and Sirah, have to be guaranteed by what is called Isnad, um, which means uh, witness, basically, or history of witnesses. So a Hadith that gets told two or three centuries after he died will come with, this was heard or written down or verified by this person, which knew personally this other person who personally talked to the Prophet. The line of witnesses has to be intact for both Hadith and Sirah. Um, and these three sources, Hadith, Surah, and the Quran, um, all of which are, are in one way or another canonical texts of Islam. I say one way or another because, of course, the Quran is a, at a higher level than the other two. Um, that's what we know about this period. Much of it is oral tradition. We talked a little bit last time about the difference between oral and written tradition. Um, I don't mean to say that oral tradition is less reliable, but it's a different way of, of gathering and, and recording information. Um, primary written sources in the Western sense are, are almost and completely lacking. Um, this is one of the few examples that there are. Um, this is the earliest one, and I, I think it is one of the only ones of the entire century. Um, we don't even know if it's genuine. It has a seal, right? This is the seal right here. Um, the seal says Muhammad on it. It's attributed to Muhammad himself, um, but we have really no way of verifying that. It begins, it's, it's clearly post-Islam. It begins here, um, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, that, that invocation at the beginning um, is, is how one starts before you say, a, a surah of the Quran, it begins many, many letters. It's a very common Islamic formulation. Um, in the name of God, the, the most powerful, most merciful, basically. Um, so it might be by him. It might be written by somebody who knew him and something he said, or it could just be a letter with a seal that says Muhammad on it. And we really don't know. But as I said, this is one of just a handful of actual written sources. So everything that we know about it has to come from um, the scriptural writings themselves. It's also worth noting that, of course, the West is still producing lots of written documents. Byzantium, in particular, writes a lot about the Islamic expansion, but they really don't understand what they are. 
Um, there's a very poor understanding of, is this a new religion? Are these heretical Jewish sects? Are these new tribal alliances? Um, some people think that they, as I said, they're heretical Jews. Some people think that they're heretical Christians. Um, but what is notable is that they're completely unprepared. They, they say, oh, there's a bunch of tribes that are sort of taking over little bits of territory. Um, they don't consider them a major threat. Um, and, and there's the one primary source that, that notes this, the Alexandria and the ships that get sent there from Constantinople. They think, oh, well, this will be easy. This will be no problem. Um, and of course, 20 years later, all of Egypt, Alexandria, and the entirety of the, of the Nile Basin has been, been stripped from, from Islam. Um, by 717, actually, there are, there are Muslim armies at the gates of Constantinople. They don't manage to take it, but they, they get that far in a period of sort of 40 or 50 years. So Byzantium and all of the Western kingdoms are completely unprepared for what happens. Um, this has a huge psychological impact on all of them, particularly because they lose many of the most important Christian sites. Um, Alexandria is the site of one of the patriarchs. Um, the Pope doesn't rise to prominence really um, until after this happens because there, there are four patriarch seats, um, Jerusalem, Constantinople, Alexandria, and Rome. Um, and Alexandria and Jerusalem disappear with the Muslim conquests, leaving only the other two. Um, but also other major sites, right? Beth Bethlehem, Hippo, which is the home of, of um, uh, St. Augustine, who, who we'll talk about when we get to Christianity. Um, these are all foundational Christian sites that get lost to the Arabs, which again, they still consider somehow a heretical sect and not exactly a new religion. Um, also many of the cities mentioned in the Bible, Ephesus, Corinth, Galicia, um, these are all cities that St. That Paul wrote letters to. Um, so there's this huge, devastating sort of psychological effect of losing all of these cities so quickly. Um, the only place that Christians remain after this, well, that's not fair. There are Christians throughout this period after the Muslim invasion. And of course, um, the question of what Christian lives and Jewish lives looked like under Islam is a, a big massive tricky question that, that I teach a whole course about in other semesters that I'm not going to go into here. Um, but the only place that Christians maintain political control um, is in the south, as I mentioned before, in Egypt, uh, in, uh, not in Egypt, um, in, in Ethiopia and parts of what, are, what is now Sudan. Um, also remember the Byzantines up until this, till this point had been fighting with the Persians and the Persians have their own huge storied history. They're very powerful. They're considered a sort of worthy ally of Byzantium. Um, in contrast, these Arab tribes appear and, and they don't really know what to do with them. Um, they have no political background. They don't, it's a little, looks a little to them like the barbarian invasions, right? They don't know exactly who to deal with. Um, the tribes are generally ruled by a sheikh, but a sheikh is a, a first among equals sort of an arrangement. It's not a king. It's not somebody who can sort of make and break treaties of their own accord. Um, so, so this causes a lot of problems for how Byzantium tries to deal with, um, Byzantium and, and the Western kingships as well, try to deal with this rise of Islam. Um, it's also worth noting that this the rapid rise and success of the Islamic expansion causes problems for the establishment of um, political bureaucracy within Islam itself. Um, the early caliphs, and basically after the death of Muhammad himself, Muhammad is both a political and a religious leader. Um, and on his death, there is a lot of disagreement as to how to replace that. Is there supposed to be another prophet? It seems fairly clear from God's prophecy that Muhammad is the last prophet. So whoever takes over can't be a prophet. They cannot be a religious leader in the same way. They could be a political leader. Um, are they both? How much are they both? And all of these questions are sort of in flux. Um, and because of this, the first four caliphs after after. Um, after Muhammad that are often referred to as the rightly guided or sort of the wise caliphs. Um, several of them die violent deaths in part because of 
contentions about exactly this question. Are they purely political leaders? Are they both? Um, eventually, the, the term caliph, right, eventually they, they become sort of protectors of the faithful. So they are the political arm who is supposed to respond to or protect the religious arm of society, as it were. Um, it's also worth noting that the first four caliphs come out of this sort of tribal familial tradition. The first one after Muhammad's death, Muhammad dies in 632, um, is his father-in-law, Abu Bakr. Um, the second one is appointed by Abu Bakr. This, this seems like it might work. Abu Bakr um, appoints um, Umar, uh, who was a companion of Muhammad earlier, um, and actually came from the same tribe, the Quraysh, which Muhammad was, was a part of. Um, Umar is actually murdered, um, and, and we're not entirely sure by who. It seems like he was murdered by a, a Persian captive, um, since he was one of the main leaders when they actually took down the Persian Empire. Um, at any rate, he's murdered, and uh, the, next, the next caliph, Uthman, is also a cousin of Muhammad, the same tribe. Um, he is an Umayyad. This is important because the first actual dynasty, the Umayyads, claims to come from Uthman's family. Um, he was a cousin of Muhammad, so again, and a companion, so again, close kinship ties, although not direct sort of father-son lineage like we saw with Rome, and, and like to some extent we see with the barbarian kingdoms, although more on that next lecture. Um, the fourth caliph, in some ways, is the most contentious. The fourth caliph, um, Ali, is Muhammad's son-in-law. So again, within this familial set, Muhammad has, has all daughters, it's worth noting. Um, and Ali is married to one of them. During the entirety of Ali's reign, because there is no agreement on exactly who should be caliph, right? Abu Bakr appoints Uman. Uman is murdered without having appointed a successor. Uthman is chosen by a sort of group of elders. He is killed in a revolt. Um, the group of elders, which presumably has changed, appoints Ali. There's a lot of contention to that. There's a civil war during this time. Um, and actually, this civil war, this is the, the origins of the Shia-Sunni divide. Um, Sunnis, uh, the, the simplest way to put it, and this is an oversimplification, you should go to Intro to Islam with Amr, who will spell all of this out for you if you want this to be clearer, but the simplest um, distinction is that Sunni Muslims are ones who think that the succession of power through the four caliphs to the Umayyads was good. Um, and the Shia are ones who think that that succession of power was wrong, and that it should have gone to Ali, Ali should have been the caliph, and Ali should have appointed a successor. And um, in fact, he does appoint a successor who, who leads a revolt against the Umayyads that is unsuccessful. Um, but at Ali's death, and again, he dies a violent death in 661, um, fighting in the Civil War, um, the next caliph claims to be uh, the great-grandson of Caliph Uthman, therefore, um, so, so would have been Muhammad's great-grand-nephew, I believe is what we would call him. Um, so again, familial ties, direct lineage from an earlier Caliph. The Umayyads established their capital um, at Damascus, and they reign for, what, 661 to 750, so about 90 years. There are several caliphs. It becomes um, passed from largely father to son at that point. Um, but in 750, there is another uprising in the, the, the Abbasids. And the, the Abbasids are claimed to descend from Abbas um, ibn Abdul Muttalib, who is Muhammad's youngest uncle, right? So still from the Quraysh tribe, still from this sort of inner circle of associates, um, but a different uncle this time. So they take power from the Umayya in 750 and move the capital to um, Baghdad. One of the last sons of the Umayyads escapes. The, the, the whole family is, is sort of murdered in their capital in Damascus, but, but 
a, a scion of the family escapes to Cordoba in Spain and actually sets up an, uh, an Umayyad dynasty there that persists into the 11th century um, and actually produces all sorts of glorious art and, and architecture while they're there. Um, but essentially the, the Umayyad dynasty in the Middle East and North Africa disappears. And they, they have this little outpost in Spain that, that continues, but um, everything then becomes Abbasid for the next couple hundred years after that. Um, one, one of the other questions that, that these various dynasties deal with, um, both, both the, the four rightly gated, guided caliphs and the Umayya and the Abbasids, is that they can't decide if they want a hereditary, hereditary king, which is what the Persian model is, right? They begin to base all of their political models on some of their conquered more politically established kingdom. So they look to Byzantium, they look to Persia, um, um, both for sort of political aspects, but as well as culture. And, and here are some of the cultural aspects, right? So, so this, this hunter, this is a very Sassanid style um, painting, um, but in, by 727, this is ruled over by Islamic rulers. Um, and, and this, this dish as well. These are both examples of, of Sassanid art still being produced under um, Islamic rule. But they, they can't decide if they want full polity to be held by a single person um, with a hereditary model like in Persia, to some extent like in Byzantium, although the imperial tradition is slightly different than that. Um, there's, it's a little flexible as regards father-son direct lineage. Or do they want to maintain a tribal council or a sheikh style system? Do they want them only to be um, a military leader? Most of the bureaucratic apparatus, everything below this, this top level, um, tends to come from already existing models that exist in Egypt that are, are, are Roman models, well Byzantine, but Roman models, um, or as I said, from Persia. Um, here is, this is, one of the last slides here are, are Byzantine and Arabic textiles. Um, you can see the Greek lettering here. This is the Byzantine one. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, the new Arabic textiles that pro get produced in the 7th century have borders and floral work, all of which are borrowed fairly directly from Byzantine models. So when they find themselves in charge of this huge empire that expands very quickly, right? And just, just to throw a couple of dates at you, um, they take Syria in 636. Um, in 651, the last of the Sassanids dies and they take all of Persia. Um, from 680 to 692, they have a little bit of a civil war and they, they this is the, the the, when the son of Ali, who I mentioned before, Hussein, gets killed in 680. This is really the beginning of the, the Shia-Sunni split that I talked about. Uh, in 685, they make Arabic the official language of this empire that now stretches from the far end of Persia to Egypt. Um, in 698, they take Carthage, which is sort of in the middle of North Africa. It's, it's where Tunisia is today. Um, and in 711, they conquer Spain. They also reach the Indus Valley in India, at the other end of the empire. Um, so, so by sort of 715, they own everything from southern France to northern India. Um, and they still haven't figured out exactly how to rule it. And that, that's probably the most enduring characteristic of Islamic polity. Um, they're looking for new models of how to be an imperial ruler, how to actually control so much territory. And the places that they look to are Byzantium and Persia, and to some extent, some of the northern kingdoms in Africa that they've taken over. Um, so that's the rise of Islam. We, we talked a little bit about the importance, the, the sense of losing all the Christian sites, the appearance of this new and very powerful group on the southern half of the Mediterranean. Um, we'll return to what that means when we talk about economy. Uh, for a long time that was considered to be a seminal moment in how Mediterranean trade looks, um, which we'll talk about in a couple of months here. 
Um, but needless to say, this is a huge change in the structure of power around the Mediterranean and in the formation of Europe itself. Um, so for the next lecture, we're going to turn back to the north. We're going to look at what happens in southern France when, when Islam arrives and what some of the barbarian tribes, particularly the Merovingian Franks and then the Carolingians, um, do to deal with that and how that sets up um, the what will be the enduring polities of Europe.